Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Joe Bilek, and I work for Microsoft. I'm on the Microsoft Offensive Research and Security Engineering team. And uh, my name is Pranav. I work as a compiler engineer for C++ compiler backend team at Microsoft. And we're here today to talk about a feature that we've been working on. Uh, we call this load time function selection. Uh, just want to note, though, that internally we call this feature function overwriting. And we're really trying to retrain ourselves. But if we accidentally say function overrides or something like that during the talk, we're talking about the same thing. It's just you know hard to, hard to retrain your brain. So before we talk about what the feature actually does, we want to talk a little bit about the problem space that we're working in and why we even went about building this thing. Um, so lots of times we have pieces of code, and memcopy is a great example, where this function is insanely hot. It's so hot that it's actually worth building a unique implementation of this function for every CPU architecture out there. So it would be worthwhile to spend the time building a specific mem copy for Alder Lake versus Broadwell versus you know, AMD systems, ARM systems, all that. Um, you get a lot of mileage out of this. Uh, or you might want to do more granular optimization. So you don't necessarily want to do it like per specific microarchitecture, but maybe you want to have different versions based on CPU features that are supported. Uh, but one of the issues is that a function like mem copy runs so fast that if the time it takes you to redirect to that more specialized implementation takes too long, then you just completely eliminate all the performance gain you got by optimizing this thing because you're spending so long to get to that optimized function. And so this sort of optimization is already done today, uh, both on Windows and on other operating systems. And I wanna talk a little bit about how we handle this sort of thing today and uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about doesn't really exist on Windows, but I'm going to talk about it in the context of how we would support it on Windows. So if you hear me saying something and you're like, wait, no, it, it doesn't work exactly like that on Linux, it's, it's probably just because I'm thinking about how would we actually do this on Windows. Different operating system works a little bit differently. Uh, so one way that we handle this, and, and this is fairly common on Windows today, is the developer needs to go and manually initialize some program state and then they need to manually use that program state. Uh, and, and there's two really common examples of ways that this ends up happening. Uh, one example is that when your binary loads, you will go and just initialize some function pointer. And then everybody who wants to call the, the function that you've optimized, like memcopy, has to call it through this function pointer that you set up so that they get the most optimized version. Uh, or another way that this ends up uh, playing out is the developer will initialize some state indicating support for various CPU features, as one example. And then inside of the function that they're optimizing, they will have a bunch of test and branches. So they'll say, oh, if, you know, if the AVX bit in my global variable is set, then use this other code path of memcopy. And uh, both of these approaches certainly work and can certainly get you some performance gains, uh, but they've got issues. Uh, so on the performance front, indirect calls are expensive. And uh, maybe not everyone here is a kernel developer, but when we're looking at building features, we want those features to work in user mode and kernel mode and all the environments that we run in so that you, you know, user experience is good. And indirect calls are super expensive in the kernel because, as probably everyone's aware, Intel and AMD and ARM had to release many patches for all these speculative execution attacks against their CPUs. And one consequence of that is that oftentimes when you transition from user to kernel, you lose a lot of your branch prediction information. And so you, you kind of start off with a fresh state when you enter kernel mode. So that makes indirect calls expensive. Uh, but indirect calls are also expensive on, on many operating systems today because we employ control flow integrity. So on Windows, this is control flow guard. Uh, on Android, they use uh, the Clang CFI package. Apple has uh, ARM CPU features that they're using, PAC. Um, but the gist of it is that when you make an indirect call, the operating system tries to validate that this indirect call looks valid and is not the result of an attacker corrupting program state. But this validation costs performance, so it, it further slows down indirect calls. Uh, test and branch also has issues because if you want to do really granular testing, you could end up with like hundreds of different test and branch statements. And so at that point, you've completely killed the performance of the function you're trying to optimize. And so usually when we do test and branch stuff today, we do it 
very coarse grained so that we have very few checks and we just do it for areas where there's a, a ton of performance on the table, like is AVX present? That's a very simple check to do and you can double your throughput of memcopy. Um, and then one other thing worth noting is that sometimes uh, folks will try to make this global state read only so that they don't need to pay the cost of control flow integrity. So they, they kind of think, well, if the function pointers are read only, then we don't need CFI checks on them because the attacker can't corrupt it. Uh, but even that isn't free because if you want to make a function pointer writable and then you want to switch it to be read only, that means that you need to ask the kernel to do a TLB shoot down. So you need to clear the translation look aside buffer for that specific page so that it is actually read only. And that shows up in benchmarks when we're looking at binary load time on Windows. And so even just making pages read only after you've initialized them is expensive. Uh, this sort of approach also really sucks from a usability perspective. Uh, something that seems simple like initializing program state is actually very complicated, especially when you start looking at all the different environments that our code runs in. Uh, so the CRT is one example where in user mode, the CRT has initializer functions that are guaranteed to be called whenever your binary gets loaded inside of a user mode application. And so we do have state initialization code that we put in those initializers. But in kernel mode, the initializers don't get run when binaries get loaded. And so if you want to be able to do this sort of optimization for kernel mode binaries, then you have to do really hacky stuff in order to get your state initialized. Uh, so it's just, it's not a very nice model to force developers to like figure out how am I gonna get the state initialized and then how am I gonna check the state anytime they wanna optimize something. And so that brings us to the GCC iFunk approach, which is really sweet because it solves a lot of the usability issues. Uh, effectively, the way that the iFunk approach works is that if you wanted to optimize a function, like memcopy as an example, uh, then you would end up defining a selector function. And the first time that anyone calls memcopy, first of all, the call is gonna go through a function pointer. Uh, but the, the function that they call is actually the selector function. That's the first thing that gets, that gets executed. And the selector function, it's written by the developer and it can do whatever it wants effectively. So, it, you know, call CPU ID, figure out what processor you're on. And at the end of the day, the job of this function is just to return you a function pointer to the most optimal memcopy function for the platform you're running on. Uh, and so this is super nice because it solves a lot of the nasty usability issues that the previous approaches had. Uh, you, you basically have a contract between the compiler and the loader that says, you know, the loader will kind of take care of this initialization for you. Uh, but <clears throat> the, the iFunk approach still has perf implications that we're not super excited about. Uh, it, it still goes through an indirect call, and so that still does cost you performance. Uh, you still have these control flow integrity concerns, so if you say, well, we're just not gonna do control flow integrity because we want this to go fast, then you're kind of opening yourselves up to security issues, which some people care about, some people don't, but for an operating system like Windows, we absolutely care about that. Um, and the other thing is that with the iFunk approach, you have this single selector function, and so, if you had a scenario like you had two libraries that you don't even necessarily own, but you had these two libraries, you were linking them in your application, and both of these libraries wanted to contribute optimized versions of memcopy, there's no way for them to both kind of merge their rules together to decide, you know, how do we choose the best memcopy? Uh, you, the developer, would presumably have to go and implement some select one selector function to rule them all that would know about all the different memcopy functions that these libraries had and, and you would have to write all the rules on your own. And so certainly not something that you need to do all the time, but the iFunk approach doesn't really allow you a, a convenient way to, to merge these things together from different libraries or different to use. And so that kind of brings us to this feature that we want to talk about, uh, which is load time function selection. And with this feature, I mean, we have lots of requirements. We can't talk about all of them, but kind of high level, uh, we want to make sure that the developer model is easy to use. Performance obviously needs to be great because that's the whole reason that we're building the thing in the first place. Uh, we need to maintain the ODR, uh, needs to be secure, and we want this to be extensible without requiring compiler updates. And we'll talk a little bit more about what exactly that means in a minute. 
So high level, what's involved here? We have these four basic building blocks. So the operating system itself defines a set of capabilities and publishes them in a header. So these are things that the operating system is aware of. You need to have a binary metadata format that this just gets embedded inside the binary. And effectively what this does is it maps, if this set of capabilities is present, here's the function you should be using. You need to have compiler support so that the developer can define this metadata in their code in a convenient way. And then the operating system needs to have support so that it can understand what capabilities it supports and then parse the binary when the binary gets loaded and rewrite the binary based on the capabilities that the operating system supports and the metadata that the binary included. So Joe described all the four essential building blocks that are required to pull this feature off. I'm going to talk about two such essential building blocks. The first is the OS capabilities. In order to allow developers to do a load time function selection on any function that they want, we need some sort of interface between the OS loader and the programs that developers are working on. And OS capabilities bridge that gap by exposing a set of capabilities through a header file in Windows SDK. These capabilities are just a set of enum constants that expand to a 64-bit integer value. And uh, these enum constants can be a spe specific CPU feature, such as AVX512 is present, or like ERMSP is present, or they can also signify a specific CPU model, such as like uh, uh, whether, Intel, whether the computer where the program is loading on is a seventh generation Intel or a ninth generation Intel or AMD Zen architecture, right? And uh, these capabilities can also be some specific operating system features or basically anything that people need. Uh, basically anything that people need and can be detected at load time can be exposed as a capability. These capabilities are also versioned. So you can see on the slide that they're, the last capability is v1 underscore cap set, which is a pseudo capability. And uh, if the pseudo capability is detected at load time, it means that all the capabilities with integer values less than this are already present and known to the operating system. One thing to note here is that OS can publish these new capabilities without really updating the toolset. Toolset doesn't really know about these capabilities. To the toolset, these capabilities are just integer values that are embedded in the final metadata. Now I'm going to talk about the second building block, and the second building block is the binary metadata. You can see on the right-hand side that uh, LTFS metadata is uh, tagged at the end of the binary, foo.dll, and uh, this metadata is stored in the binary, in the PE binary in the DVRT format. DVRT expands to dynamic value relocation table, and uh, we already use this format for technologies like kernel ASLR and all that stuff. This uh, LTFS metadata lives inside of a reloc section in the final PE binary, and uh, now I'm going to zoom in into this LTFS metadata. This LTFS metadata contains the information for each function that receives the load time function selection. For each function that receives the load time function selection, we have three components. The first component is a BDD, which expands to binary decision diagram. And it represents the evaluation criteria that uh, user specifies in a C++ program. The second component is RVA. And this is an array that contains the RVA of every candidate function that can be replaced by the loader at load time. The third component is the fix-up RVA, and uh, this component contains RVA of every location in the binary that direct calls or jumps into the target function. So if you have a function like memcopy and you have a load time function selection feature turned on for that memcopy, and memcopy is called like thousands of times in your program, this fix-up array is going to contain the location of every location where memcopy is called or jumped into. We do some optimizations on this, uh, and we are going to talk about that in future slides. Now I would like to zoom in into one of the components that I talked about in the previous slide, and that is binary decision diagram, BDD. This BDD is the heart of this feature, and uh, it's, pretty simple to, it's pretty simple to understand. Each node in the BDD is uh, either a decision node or a leaf node. A decision node contains the capability that the OS loader checks for, and uh, then you have two children for the decision node. One is the true children, one is the false children. 
the green children here in this case is the true children and the red one is the false children. If the capability is detected at load time, we are going to go to the true children. If the capability is not detected at load time, we go to the false children. And eventually we will reach a leaf node. And leaf node can be of two types. Leaf node can either be an index into a table that contains the RVA of the selected function. Or the leaf node can be a null node, which means that the evaluation criteria did not give any function that the OS loader can use to replace the original function with. The RVA table, as you can see on the right-hand side, is the same RVA array that I talked about in the previous slide as the, oops, sorry, um, as I talked about in the previous slide, as the RVAs array. So this RVAs array contained the list of all the functions and the index is mentioned at the leaf node for the binary decision diagram. Now I'm going to hand it over to Joe who's going to glue things together for us by describing other building blocks. Okay, so how do we actually specify this stuff in the compiler? And this is one area where we really have not finalized the design and one of the reasons that we're here talking today is because we'd like to get people's feedback on if they think we're going down the, the right approach or if there's, there's other things you'd like to see here. Um, so we'd certainly be happy to talk to people after the talk or anytime during the conference. So we have a number of different scenarios that we wanna support. And we kinda of talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, but one thing that we definitely want the ability to support is an ordered set of criteria. And what we mean by an ordered set of criteria is that something, we want something that is conceptually similar to having a bunch of if statements. So if foo and bar are supported, then use function foo bar. If foo is supported, then use function foo. If bar is supported, then use function bar. And so just like how you might write something in your source code where you have you know, a bunch of conditions that you're checking in order, uh, we want the ability to do that with this feature. We wanna have flexibility with function naming. And what I mean by that is, this is a C++ conference, so everyone here is probably familiar with name mangling, right? You have same function name, but different parameters. The compiler goes and does name mangling for you so that uh, all that stuff just works. And we would like this feature to also support name mangling so that the capabilities required to use a function can be mangled into the name of the function automatically, if that's what the developer wants. But we also know that a lot of these functions that we're gonna use this feature on need to be implemented in assembly, or maybe they're implemented in C. We don't really know exactly where they're gonna be implemented. And so we need to give the developer the ability to just specify plain X turn C style names for these different candidate functions that might be selected uh, so that you can implement it in whatever language you need to implement it in. Uh, and then the last thing that we want is the ability to merge criteria from multiple TUs or multiple libraries in some sort of sane, predictable way for developers. So in order to support this, we have two concepts that we're, we're working with right now. The first concept is a qualifier, and the second concept is an ordered map. And it's worth noting that both qualifiers and ordered maps work on the exact same set of operating system criteria. So you could request AVX support in the qualifier, in the ordered map, or in both if you wanted to, it would be redundant, but you can do that. It's the same capabilities in play. Uh, qualifiers and ordered maps can be used together or independently. So you could just specify a qualifier, you could just specify an ordered map. Um, and the last thing is that the function that you're going to use load time function selection on, at a minimum, needs to be defined with this new dispatch attribute that we are creating. And Pranav will talk a little bit more about why that's so important later. Okay, so what is a qualifier? Qualifier is a set of capabilities that get automatically merged together by the linker. And an ordered map is the thing that I was previously talking about, which is conceptually similar to a bunch of if statements. Um, and it is the order that the developer specifies is preserved. So I'm gonna drill down into how exactly these work now. So with qualifiers, the idea here is that you can have no qualifier, of course, um, or you can have a qualifier with a single capability or multiple capabilities. So you could have a qualifier with 100 capabilities in it if you want it. Now the order in which those capabilities appear in the qualifier does not matter at all. The linker is going to reorder it all anyways. And similarly, 
The order in which the linker sees qualifiers does not matter at all, because it's going to reorder these things uh, on its own anyway. So if you have two TUs, both of them have a qualifier for the same base function like memcopy, it does not matter if TU1 or TU2 gets linked first. The way that the linker ends up ordering the capabilities in the qualifier is based on whichever capability has the lowest numerical constant value. And I have some examples that's gonna, it's gonna make a lot more sense when you see examples. Um, but the, the, the capability with the smallest value gets evaluated first, and then the next smallest value gets evalu evaluated second. Uh, and then the other thing worth noting, and again, we have examples for this, is that the most specific qualifier goes first. So if you have two capabilities, or if you have two qualifiers, and they both have a shared capability that they want, but one of them then has a second capability that it wants, so it's a little bit more specialized, that one will go first in the evaluation. So let's look at some examples, because I think that, that um, it makes a lot more sense when we look at examples. Um, so in these examples, we have two TUs here, and um, I'm just gonna use my laser pointer on, on this screen over here. Um, so we have this qualifier syntax here, and then we specify there's this keyword all, and then capabilities, so AVX and ERMSB. So this is saying, I have a version of memcopy to use if AVX and ERMSB capabilities are present. And the second TU down here is also for the same memcopy function, but it says I have a memcopy to use if this capability memcopy accelerator is present. And for the purposes of this example, let's assume that memcopy accelerator has the lowest constant value. So its value is five, and ERMSB is the next smallest, and then AVX is the biggest. So based on what I just said on the previous slide, that means that the first capability we should be checking is going to be memcopy accelerator, because it's the smallest. So let's look at what the BDD ends up looking like. Um, so at the very top, we check, is memcopy accelerator present? And if it is, then we know what function to use, this memcopy accelerator function. And it would be name mangled, but you know, it's really ugly looking at mangled names, right? So I just put a, a more friendly name here. So memcopy accelerator, but magically name mangled by the compiler, right? If that is not present, then we move on to the capability that has the next smallest numerical value, which is ERMSB. And I'm just gonna go back to the previous slide really quick. You'll see that the, um, this, this qualifier here, it doesn't just require ERMSB, it requires both of these things, ERMSB and AVX. So this qualifier says, okay, so I'll evaluate is ERMSB present, and if it is, then I also need to check if AVX is present. And if both of those were present, then you can use this memcopy ERMSB AVX function. Again, be name mangled, it's really ugly, so I'm putting a friendly name here. Now if um, ERMSB or AVX was not present, then that effectively means that neither qualifier could be matched, and so you just kind of fall back to using this default memcopy function. So that's one example. I want to show another example, though, where we have two qualifiers that have a shared capability to show how that merging happens. So the first TU has the exact same qualifier. It's looking for both ERMSB and AVX. And the second TU is just looking for ERMSB. Okay, so they both have a shared capability. And assume the same numerical values. So ERMSB is the smallest, and AVX is the biggest. So in this case, the first thing that we're gonna check is the presence of ERMSB, because that's got the smallest value now. And if ERMSB is present, then we're going to check for the presence of AVX. And if AVX is present, then we're going to use that, that function that, that had a more specific qualifier. So one of those qualifiers was looking for both ERMSB and AVX, so that one goes first. If AVX isn't present, then you just use the ERMSB function. So the, the, the great thing about qualifiers is that they give you a defined way that the linker is going to merge things from multiple TUs or multiple libraries. But the downside of qualifiers is that they can be kind of tricky to really make sense of if you have a lot of them. Because 
you have definitions kind of all over the place in your program potentially, or maybe you just have two qualifiers, but they're not in a single spot. So you got to look at multiple places in your code. And in order to understand how these qualifiers get merged together, you need to look not only at the capabilities that the qualifier specifies, but also the numerical value associated with those capabilities. So you can see how are they going to merge relative to these other qualifiers that have these other capabilities. Um, so it gives us that merging capability, but if you have a lot of specialized functions, it could end up being pretty overwhelming to make sense of how all of these things will be ordered relative to one another. And so that's why we also have this ordered map. And the, the idea behind the ordered map is that the developer just specifies in this ordered map, you know, a list of these capabilities correspond to this function, and it gets evaluated in order by the operating system loader. You don't care about what the numerical value of the qualifiers is, you just care, are all these qualifiers present? If so, here's the function to use. Uh, so here's an example, an example of, of what the ordered map approach would look like. And we just, we have four lines here. Um, so the first line is looking for is ERMSB and AVX2 present? If so, here's the function to use. So if this qualifier was evaluated by the operating system, if those two capabilities were present, boom, you're done. You know which function to use, memcopy, ERMSB, AVX2. Um, if both of those capabilities were not present, then you just move on down to the next line, right? And, and evaluate the next thing, and so on and so on. Now, the BDD for this can be kind of ugly if you don't optimize it. One thing I want to call your attention to is that the first three items in this ordered map all check for ERMSB, the capability. Um, so if we just implemented the BDD without any sort of optimization for this sort of thing, you'd end up with this kind of crazy looking graph here where you say, okay, is ERMSB present? If no, you move on to the next line of the, of, of the ordered map which says, is ERMSB present? And if no, you move to the next line of that ordered map, which says, is ERMSB present? And if no, then you can finally go and check the very last thing and say, okay, is AVX present? Um, so clearly there's a lot of redundant evaluation happening here, but we can optimize this pretty easily, just like compilers already do for redundant branches in your application today. And we can say, well, I mean, if, if we already just saw that ERMSB is not present, we don't need to check if ERMSB is present again, right? Um, so the tree can merge into something that looks a lot nicer. And at the end of the day, the only thing you need to keep in mind is just that when the tree is evaluated, it needs to be evaluated in the order that the developer specified all this stuff. So the last thing I want to talk about is how we combine these two concepts together. Uh, so this graph here is really just a slight modification of the very first example that I showed, the very first qualifier example. So we said, hey, is memcopy accelerator present? If no, then you know, look for the other qualifier. But if yes, if that qualifier is met, then you go here to this yellow box, which is really just, in, in, in the previous example, it was a leaf node. It said, here's the function to use, right? But it's really just a node in the BDD that represents this qualifier was matched. So if you don't have an ordered map, then that can just be a leaf node. Okay, this is, the, this is the exact original example now, right? Qualifiers match, here's the function to use. But what if you had syntax that looked kind of like this, where um, we have, this is the original qualifier that I had shown, so it's looking for ERMSB and AVX, so that's not modified. But the second TU down here has a different qualifier, uh, or sorry, it has, um, it's, it's set up a little bit differently. It still has this qualifier looking for memcopy accelerator, but it also specifies a map. And the map says if both AVX2 and AVX512 are supported, here's a function to use. If only AVX2 is supported, here's a function to use. And it has this default function which says if nothing in the ordered map was matched, here's a name of the function to use. So that thing has both a qualifier and an ordered map. And in that case, the BDD, really, it, it's not that complicated. You just have two trees that you're merging together. So if that qualifier is matched and all qualifiers are merged relative to one another by the linker, right? So when, when they're merged, if that memcopy accelerator qualifier is matched, then rather than leading to a leaf node, it just leads to the first node in the ordered map that was specified for it, right? So this gives you the ability to merge together 
different qualifiers from different TUs, but those qualifiers can also have an ordered map associated with them. So you could have one TU, for example, that says, hey, you know, if this special piece of hardware, if, if there's a memcopy accelerator that's present, then I've got a whole bunch of different implementations. And then inside, it can have an ordered map that says, oh, you know, if it's the, you know, company foo's memcopy accelerator, then here's the function use. If it's company bars accelerator, then, you know, use this other one. So it can have a whole ordered map in, in, inside of it, um, but it has a way to merge all of those implementations in with other memcopy implementations that might be present on the system. And so, really, I mean, our, our thinking here is that this approach, it, it gives us both that ability to have this like very structured data, um, but also have the ability to merge things in from multiple TUs in a way that is predictable. Um, and all of this stuff is possible to support with C and C++ code, it's possible to support with assembly, uh, and so it, it gives us all the flexibility we want. It gives us the developer friendliness, or we think it gives us the developer friendliness that we want. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, that's, that's kind of where we are with the design. But again, we'd love to get people's feedback after the talk or anytime during CppCon if folks have uh, I, you know, other ideas here or things that we're missing. Okay, so the final piece, the final building block, we spent a lot of time talking about compiler syntax, but the final building block here was operating system support for the feature. And the OS support is really not uh, particularly complicated. When the operating system boots up, it just goes and figures out what capabilities do I support based on the hardware that's connected to me, based on the configuration of the operating system. And then whenever binaries get loaded, the operating system needs to parse out that metadata and apply fix-ups on the binary so that anyone that's calling into these functions that use this load time function selection feature end up having their uh, control flow diverted into the more optimal function for that platform. We already have a preliminary support in the tool chain to support this feature. Now I'm going to do a deep dive into the tool chain details. So, we have worked hard to make this feature as easy to use as possible. And all you need to do is you just need to throw a new flag called experimental load time selection and the compiler is going to do all the magic for you. Um, the earlier prototype we had was a bit complicated. You had to specify different files to the linker, but this time you're just supposed to uh, mention the MSVC dispatch attribute as Joe talked about and throw this new flag. There are two modifications that compiler make to the externally visible data structures. The first modification that it makes is to the symbol table. For every dispatch attributed function called function name, it's going to emit a new symbol called function name underscore LTFS. And the second modification that it makes to the external data structure is that it adds a new section in the final cough object. And uh, for every translation unit that contains at least one dispatch attributed function, it's uh, going to store the dispatch metadata in this new section that we add. And this section is going to contain everything that was specified by the user in the MSVC dispatch attribute. It's going to contain all the uh, formulas, evaluation criteria, and the final candidate functions that we talked about in the previous slides. There are also some internal modifications that compiler makes, and uh, the first modification that it makes is that it disables inlining for all the dispatch attributed function. LTFS can only apply to direct calls and jumps, so if you inline something, loader is not going to be able to replace that inline implementation with something else. So this is a constraint that we have. And the second modification that compiler does is that it disables any bottom-up interprocedural register analysis. So normally, when compiler generates code for your programs, the code gen of the caller is dependent on the code gen of their colleagues. And uh, if the callers can make use of the volatile registers, which are not used by its callees, then caller can just uh, keep using those volatile registers without saving and restoring them across the calls. So let's say you have a function main and you have a function foo. Function foo is not really using any volatile register. Function main doesn't need to worry about restoring, uh, saving the registers and restoring them again through the call, right? So um, caller can just assume that the values of the register is going to be same. But in this case, since the target function is dynamic and the foo function can be replaced with foo underscore AVX, which may be using the volatile registers, 
it kind of breaks the interface and uh, you will have correctness issues. So that's for that reason, we disable the bottom-up interprocedural analysis. There are a few more things that I would like to talk about. Joe talked about uh, these all, this all expression where you can combine the capabilities, but like there are other ways to express uh, uh, formulas here as well. The first way is that you can do an any expression and then you can a none expression. In this case, uh, uh, the first foo underscore AVX is going to be executed if any of AVX and AVX2 is present, and then we have another way to express uh, none, which means that if none of, the ex none of the arguments are present, then execute this function. I would also like to touch on the const expert support. So what happens if you would like to make a function which is a const expert, a dispatch attributed function? You can do that, but uh, there is a caveat, and uh, you will have to split your const expert function into two. You'll have to use a std is const evaluated, which is exposed in the STL, and you'll have to split your implementation such that if the function foo is called in a const expert context, the if branch is taken, and if the function foo is called in a non-const expert context, there is a separate set of instructions that's going to be replaced by the loader based on the metadata that you mentioned in the dispatch attribute. Now I'm going to take you to a tour of a life of a dispatch attributed function foo, and we are going to look into the internal compiler dumps and see how all of this uh, uh, programs with the dispatch attributed functions are converted into final uh, PE binary. So I have a simple program here. There is function main, and uh, function main is using a function foo, which is a dispatch attributed function. The dispatch attributed function contains very simple evaluation criteria, and it says that if AVX512 is present, call foo underscore AVX512. If that fails, check if AVX2 is present. If AVX2 is present, instead of calling foo, call foo underscore AVX2. And uh, the first thing, you use the compiler to emit the cough object, and you just throw the new compiler switch that I mentioned earlier. You can see that there are some modifications to the symbol table we are making. The, in the middle of the image, you can see that I have highlighted through the red line. Um, there is this new symbol that looks exactly the same as the original function foo, but it has an LTFS prefix to it. The second modification is at the end of the image where you can see that now I have a new section that is called LTFS map. And this LTFS map section contains everything that was mentioned by the user in the dispatch attributed function foo in the previous slide. Now let's dive deep into the contents of the LTFS map section. So I look into this LTFS map section of the object file that was emitted by the compiler. You can see the raw data, and raw data contains the name of the functions. It contains the name of the original function foo, and uh, then it contains the name of the candidate functions. And then evaluation criteria is also embedded in this raw data section, but since evaluation criteria does not represent any ASCII correctors, it's showing us as dots. So basically everything that is required to construct the final BDD is in this section. Now, Linker does its job. Linker takes all the different translation units, all the LTFS map sections, and it combines everything together to construct the final BDD that we talked about in the previous slides. Linker is going to error out if any function is a dispatch attributed function in one translation unit, but not the other and it collects all the call sites for every dispatch attributed function, and the final BDD is then constructed from merging these LTFS maps together from different translation units based on the rules that Joe described. Uh, if you have a qualifier in your MSVC dispatch attribute, the linker is going to take into consideration the values of those uh, qualifiers, and then it's going to uh, construct the final BDD based on that. The linker also generates thunks, and I'm going to talk more about this thunk, which is more of an optimization approach based on uh, what I talked about earlier. It will get more clear as I go through next slides. So how do we support indirect calls in this case? The linker modifies any code that takes the address of the target function foo to instead takes off the generated thunk. Because imagine like the function foo in this case is dynamic. So if you take the address of the function, Th that function foo is not going to be function foo at after load time, right? Because the loader is going to replace that function foo with something else. So we'll have some correctness issues there. So instead of taking the address of the function foo 
we take the address of the generated thunk, that remains constant. It will get more clear how. And as I mentioned, we do that because pointer comparisons need to work at runtime, and uh, um, it needs to work irrespective of whether loader does the replacement or not. It's also important for DLL exported functions. If uh, you have a MSVC dispatch attribute against a function that is DLL exported, thunk is the function that gets exported by the DLL, not the original function foo. We also use thunks for the direct calls, and it will get more clear uh, why, do, why we do that. So all the direct calls to function foo in your program are actually going to be direct calls to foo underscore thunk, and that foo underscore thunk is then going to call function foo. There are also some interesting ARM64 specific uh, uh, corner cases that we encountered when we were implementing this feature. Uh, so in ARM64, a direct call is either a BL instruction or a B instruction, and this instruction has a limited range. Like, it can only reach up to 128 megabytes, unlike, uh, unlike AMD64, where the range is much bigger and we don't need to worry about it. So in case of ARM64, we have to insert branch islands so that if the target function is farther than 128 megabytes, the BL instruction first jumps into this island, and this island then jumps into the final target function. But as you can imagine that uh, um, in this case, the target is dynamic, like, like I don't really know at compile time that which of the function is going to be finally executed because this function foo can be function foo underscore AVX that may be too far away. So just conservatively in this LTFS feature, we just uh, take into account the farthest function that is uh, available and based on that, we insert the branch island. Um, now, after the linker is done linking the final binary, we have uh, this BDD in the final PE binary format. We do a topological sort of the BDD that you saw earlier, because BDD is just a directed acyclic graph, so we just do a topological sort of that, we store that in, into an array, and then we put that array into the final, BE, into the final uh, PE binary, which is mentioned here. This is just an array. And uh, this is, so these are the three components that I was talking about earlier in my earlier slides. This is the BDD component, this is the RVA component, and then this is the fix up component, fix up RVA's component. Uh, you can see on the right hand side what's going on. Uh, I have disassembled the main function, I have disassembled the foo thunk function. So the main function is not really calling function foo, it's calling the function foo underscore thunk, and the foo thunk function is calling then the function foo. And we do that to um, optimize this because otherwise you will have a lot of fix up RV entries here. So to make that clear, let's look at another slide where I am actually using this new flag called LTFS on call sites that gets rid of all the thunks. So now if you look at the disassembly of function main, it's calling function foo directly, right? But that means that we will have more fix up RV entries. So you can see that I have two fix up RV entries now instead of just one because these call sites also need to be mentioned, and OS loader needs to know where it needs to do the patching. Then there is another thing called relocation type, and this relocation type tells the user how tells the OS loader how to patch the final binary. So in this case, if type is one, it knows that it's a call instruction and it needs to replace the four bytes. And if the relocation type is something like type three, it notes that uh, um, it's an ADRP instruction in ARM64 and it needs to do, use a different kind of semantics in order to uh, point to the final candidate function. Uh, this, is, this is the final thunk page that we have and uh, all the thunks that, all the automatically generated thunks that I talked about earlier, they live in a separate page. And you can see that we have all these thunks here that or only thing that these thunks are doing is they are just calling the final function. It's not really obvious here um, how they are calling the final function, but because uh, of this ADRP add and BR instruction in ARM64, but all these thunks are doing is instead of calling, uh, like this foo4 thunk is actually calling function foo4 and foo2 thunk is actually calling function foo2. And uh, um, you will have this thunk page in a separate section in the final binary, which is called foo thunk. Now, I would like to hand it over to Joe, who's going to talk about OS details. All right, so the first thing that I want to talk about a little bit more is fix-ups and this thunk page that we've been talking about. 
So conceptually, the way fixups work is fairly simple. When the binary loads, if the binary has fixups, and the binary can have fixups for a variety of reasons. So a binary might have fixups because you're using this feature that we're talking about. But binaries also have fixups for other reasons. If your binary has a hard-coded address in it that depends on, you know, you take the address of a function, you don't actually know exactly where that function is going to be when you load the binary. So the binary has a desired base address, and it hard codes the address of the function based on that desired base address. And when the operating system loads the binary, it probably loads it to a different address, and then it goes and applies fixups to the binary to say, hey, you had all these spots that hard coded these addresses because you thought you were going to be loaded to address foo, but I actually loaded you to this other address, so I'm going to go and modify all those hard coded addresses in your binary. So binaries have fixups for lots of reasons. And conceptually, we just apply these fixups when the binary loads. But in practice, we actually are a lot smarter about it than that because this would be extraordinarily expensive to do. If you think about a binary like Chrome that's over 100 megabytes big, you, know, you don't want to sit there just churning through applying fixups on every page of this binary just because someone launched the web browser. So what Windows does instead is when we load a binary, we record a copy of all of that fixup information in the kernel. So we have all the info we need to apply fixups to any page in the binary, but we don't actually apply any of them. We apply fixups whenever a page that needs fixups applied gets paged in. So the first time you go and, and you call some function and that function has a fixup in it, that's when the fixup gets applied. And one thing that this also allows us to do as a result is that when you want to go and page out a code page from a binary, and assuming that your application has not made its own private changes to that code page, um, we don't actually page out the code page. There's no reason to. We just throw it away. We already have the code page on disk. It's part of the binary. And we know how to apply fixups when we read that code page back in from the binary. Um, so this is how Windows handles fixups today. Uh, the kernel just caches all the info, and, and we apply whenever we page something in. This also makes things like clustered paging more efficient on Windows, um, but we're not going to really talk about that too much. Um, so one thing that folks might be wondering is you're building this performance feature, and it's supposed to have like zero overhead, and then you all started talking about this thunk that you're redirecting us through. What, what's up with that? It, it kind of sounds like a backwards optimization, right? Like you used to have a direct call to memcopy, but now you have a direct call to this thunk that does a direct jump into memcopy. And the reason that we do this sort of thing is because if, if we don't have the thunk and you have a function like memcopy that's used all over your binary, you could end up with thousands, tens of thousands of spots in your binary that end up calling memcopy and need a fix up applied. And sure, that fixup only gets applied when you, you know, page in some page of memory, but we still need to cache all that information in the kernel so that we know how to apply fixups. So that means that your system's going to be using more memory because we, we're caching so much fixup information for your binary. And it also means that when you go and, and page in some page of your binary, not only do you need to wait for us to load this thing off disk, but you need to wait for us to crank through this page and apply tons of fixups to it. And so, you know, that, that costs you perf. So there's kind of a balance here where, uh, you know, from a strict, you know, CPU throughput perspective, it might be faster to not use the thunks, but uh, overall, we think that it's, it's probably better to use them. Um, there's actually an even more pressing concern, though. So some folks here might be familiar with container technology. And on Windows, we actually have two flavors of containers, um, one of which that we use quite a lot are called Hyper-V containers. And the point of a Hyper-V container is it works effectively just like a normal container, except that you do not have a shared kernel. You have hypervisor isolation between the host and the container, which means that each container is running its own complete kernel. And the reason we do this is for security. But as you can imagine, Running your own separate kernel in each container has a lot of memory overhead associated with it. And on Windows, we have lots and lots of DLLs, I'm sure everyone here knows. Hundreds of megabytes worth of DLLs get loaded anytime you boot your operating system. And luckily for us, on uh, both AMD64 and ARM64 architectures, typically code pages don't have fixups in them because the instruction set is all uh, um, PC relative 
So you, you don't really need to hard code addresses inside of code pages. And so one optimization that we do for Hyper-V containers is we actually share the physical memory for user mode binary code pages between the host and the container guests. So NTDLL that's running in your host is backed by the same physical memory as NTDLL running in the guest. But we can't share those physical pages if the page has fix-ups on it. Because the page can have fix-ups for lots of reasons, right? The page could have fix-ups because it, uh, you know, it has a, a hard-coded address in it. Well, the binary could be loaded at a different address in the guest, so we can't share that page. Or in the case of this feature, load time function selection, you can have different capabilities in the guest, so we can't share the pages if they have fix-ups on them. And so if you applied load time uh, function selection to memcopy and you end up with fix-ups on every single code page in your binary, all of a sudden, we go from being able to share hundreds of megabytes worth of physical memory between the, the host and the container to being able to share probably zero megabytes of memory between the host and container, so it's a huge density loss. Uh, so the thunk, it seems like you know, we're, we're kind of de-optimizing a little bit, but it's actually there for very good reasons. It is, it is actually an optimization. All right, so we are going to do a, a quick demo of the feature, and then I'm just going to talk about some of the current perf results that we've had with the feature. We're still pretty early in um, deploying the feature, so we don't have tons of info yet, but we're going to share what we do have. Pranav, you want to do this demo? Yeah. So now I'm going to do a demo that uh, contains a very simple program, and the user is going to make a function, a dispatch attributed function. I recorded this demo just yesterday on a Windows 11 preview build system, and uh, um, I'm using the Visual Studio IDE, which contains a modified compiler that I have been working on, which is not publicly accessible as of now, but the, all the changes, all the operating system changes are publicly accessible. So let's see what, what we do here. We write a very simple function, main, that calls a function foo, that prints I am original foo, and then I click on the run button, and you can see that it prints I am original foo, right? Now let's say we have to make this function foo a dispatch attributed function. So I go ahead and uh, I try to make some modification. I go to the function foo and uh, I use the syntax as we described in previous slides. I use MSVC dispatch. I use the map attribute that is going to contain the ordered map. It's going to say that if AVX512 is available, call foo underscore AVX512. If AVX2 is available, call foo underscore AVX2. And then I'm going to include a header file that contains the definition of AVX512 and AVX2. And then I'm going to just fill the implementation for my candidate functions. And now I'm going to press the run button and guess what's going to happen. Instead of calling the function foo at runtime, it's going to call the function based on the capabilities on this uh, um, operating system, on this computer. In this case, I do not have AVX 512 available on this machine, but I do have AVX 2 available on this machine. So let's see what happens. I press the run button and it says I'm AVX 2 foo because AVX 512 was not available, so it fall back to the second condition. And the second condition was AVX 2, which means that it executed this new function. So let's see from current slide. Yeah. There you go. All right, super cool stuff. Uh, so first thing folks might be wondering, hopefully not, but maybe, is like, why does this matter? I mean, we're spending all this time fighting over a few clock cycles. Is, does it really make that big of a difference? So this is just a graph um, showing you know, a comparison of two different memset functions that I was working on. One of them uses AVX, one of them doesn't. And this just measures the total runtime of the function for a variety of different sizes. Really, all I'm trying to illustrate here is it really matters a lot to execute the most optimal code on your system. We can get like a two times throughput speed up on something like memset just by using a different instruction set. So the perf gains that can be had here are real. And you know, a lot of these functions like memset, memcopy, and, and other functions of this nature these are actually some of the hottest functions on the system. So really small differences to these functions can make really huge differences in, in performance for your, for your applications. So that's why we care about this stuff so much. So on Intel, uh, I've, I've done some basic micro benchmarking, and um, effectively what we found here is if you just make 100,000 calls to some ASM function, and the ASM function just moves one into a register and then returns. So it does effectively nothing, right? Um, 
The time it takes to make 100,000 of these calls, if you just make a direct call to this function, it's about 3.2 cycles per call. And a lot of that is probably just overhead from the loop, too, because I'm just measuring the whole thing. If you make an indirect call and you have control flow guard enabled, you double it. If you make an indirect call and you don't have control flow guard enabled, you're about at 4.1 cycles. And if you use this load time function selection feature with these thunks, you're also at about 4.1 cycles. OK, so that's surprising, right? Like you might be thinking, wait, it's, it sounds like this feature isn't really that great of a performance optimization. There's a few things to note here. So first off, Control Flow Guard in practice has way, way more overhead than 3.2 cycles. This is the best case scenario for Control Flow Guard because you're just constantly calling the same function. So the, the security checks that it does predict really well, all the data is hot in the cache, but in practice, it can have really, really big performance implications. Indirect calls versus the long time or load time function selection calls. It looks like they're identical, but in practice, indirect calls only go this fast if you have good branch prediction information available. When we transition to the kernel, for example, we don't. And if you're running a really big application that's executing a lot of code, you can totally exhaust the branch prediction information that your CPU has available. So you don't necessarily have good branch prediction information available to you. And the, the load time function selection code you know, even though, even though you do have this extra hop you're doing through a thunk, it's really not that big of a deal. Because in practice, we expect that the thunks are going to be very hot in memory. They're, all the thunks are clustered together on a single, you know, a single page or a, you know, a small grouping of pages, really densely populated in cache lines. And so those things are very likely to always have branch prediction information available. And on the actual call into the thunk, well, if you have branch prediction available, great. If you don't, though, it's a direct call. And a direct call with no branch prediction information available is a lot faster than an indirect call with no branch prediction information available. So in practice, we expect this stuff to perform a lot better than indirect calls. On ARM, it's somewhat similar story here. If you just look at micro benchmarks on uh, the, like the, the ARM system I was testing on, if you look at big cores on ARM, uh, indirect call versus load time function selection, pretty similar performance-wise. Interestingly, on little cores for the ARM CPUs that I was testing on, it is actually a three-cycle advantage for load time function selection to you know, use this thunk call mechanism instead of doing an indirect call. And that's with perfect branch prediction information, you know, micro benchmark. So we're actually able to beat indirect calls in that case. Um, worth noting, too, that on one of these ARM little cores, uh, the current memcopy implementation, at least, that Windows is running with, it takes about, I think it's 18 or 19 clock cycles to do a small memcopy, like a 16-byte memcopy. So when you're talking about a three-cycle advantage, you know, it might seem like not that much. But that's like 15% of the, the total runtime of memcopy for a small size. So we actually are very interested in, in that sort of performance gain. Uh, but let's look at more real-world use cases for this feature. So we have a prototype memcopy function on Windows for ARM64 that with, I mean, literally like an hour spent writing this function, so we've really not micro-optimized at all, but just the overall strategy that this function uses, it's about 20 to 30% faster than the current memcopy that we use. But there's a caveat. We can only do this on the very latest versions of Windows because it relies on some memory manager changes. And our CRTs run on all versions of Windows, so we can't just check in this new version of memcopy that you know, makes your software not work on older versions of the operating system. So we really want this perf gain bad, but we need to have effectively no overhead you know, and able to get it. And that's what load type function selection lets us do, is we can switch between the old memcopy that's highly compatible and this new memcopy that only works on the newest versions of the OS really with, without having any overhead. Um, another use case that we've been looking at is Control Flow Guard itself, which I've mentioned a few times here. And I'm not going to get really in, in the weeds on how Control Flow Guard works, but this is a technology that whenever your application makes an indirect call, we actually add a second indirect call right in front of it to a check function. This check function goes and tries to make sure that the indirect call your application is trying to do does not violate the security of the system. And uh, this sort of thing, in some benchmarks, it has really no regression. But in some benchmarks, it can have pretty considerable regression. Uh, in, in some of the spec 2017 
tests, just as an example, uh, control flow guard on ARM64 can have a regression of 7, 8, 9, 10%. Uh, one of them benchmarks is actually regressed about 18%. It's a pretty huge regression there. And then some of them are regressed 0%. So it's kind of all over the board. It depends on what the app is doing. Um, but, but sometimes it certainly has performance implications. And we've been looking at replacing this indirect call that Control Flow Guard introduces with load time function selection instead. And in some of the benchmarks, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really make much of a difference. But in some of these benchmarks, it's actually reducing the overhead of Control Flow Guard by about 50%. Uh, so that like 18% regression we're seeing, it's down to about 10, 11% just by getting rid of an indirect call and using load time function selection. And that's on a big core, an ARM64 big core. And so even though the micro benchmark shows that uh, you know, indirect call, pretty equivalent to load time function selection, the real world data shows that uh, it's actually much faster, or I shouldn't say real world, but um, like having a much bigger benchmark, not just a tiny micro, micro benchmark, shows that it's actually very beneficial to uh, get rid of the indirect calls. So looking forward for this feature, you know, we're here presenting about it because we're excited about it, but also because we want to get people's feedback on what sorts of things you think would be useful for this, you know, if you like it, if you don't like it, um, where you think we should go. So we absolutely want to solicit feedback. Um, we are planning on using this sort of thing in Windows going forward. It's not really used much today, um, but we have a number of use cases, some of the ones I just talked about, where we're looking to really crank up operating system performance by taking advantage of this. Uh, the feature itself is supported in the latest Win uh, Windows Insider dev channel builds, but the compiler support is not there yet. Um, we're tentatively planning on shipping that in 17.5 Preview 1. We're not absolutely committed to that. If it takes us longer to build it, it takes us longer to build it, but that's the goal right now. So hopefully everyone can start using the feature super soon. So, yep. Um, do we have time for questions? Nope. No time for questions. So um, we can take questions out in the hall, though, if, uh, if people want to chat. And um, you, know, you can also just find us here at the conference and chat with us anytime. Microsoft's got a booth uh, over in the vendor area. So yeah, um, feel free to reach out.